Welcome to our study. Lessons from the book of Revelation, lesson 12 of 26, Revelation chapter 8, by Ellis Jones. The title of this lesson is The Four Winds Blow, The Barbarian Invasions. Lesson text. We'll meet this verse again later. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Introduction The silence in heaven that comes with the blowing of the first trumpet represents the period of time that the four winds are held back in which the 144,000 are sealed and until the barbarians begin to invade the empire. Remember, they're hurtful winds that are going to hurt the land, the sea, and the trees. I believe this is a period between the victory of Constantine and the first barbarian invasion. It's a time of relative tranquility for the empire when the gospel can spread, not only throughout the empire, but into the barbarian tribes. Let me take a look. Let's take a look at that map. Here we have another map. Uh, here we have a map of the barbarian invasion. The Huns, the the, uh, Visig the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, you'll see them there, and the uh, Heruli. There are four groups, four main groups. There were others that were attached to them, but there are four main groups. Then, as each trumpet blow is blown, a new invasion is unleashed on the empire. First, the Goths descended from the north, scorching the earth wherever they went. They took Italy and sacked the capital city. Next, the Vandals came, conquering the lands and islands around, round and on the sea. The, then Attila and the Huns came, turning the rivers red with the blood of the slain. Finally, Odoacer and the Heruli seemed to extinguish the light of Roman civilization. But God still rules in the kingdom of men, kingdoms of men. Here we have another map. And up above, you see the legend there. It shows the uh, kingdoms of Attila. Well, it shows the Vandals, the Visigoths, and so forth. So have, take, a t take time to study that. Another look at the map showing the barbarian invasion. There were four main ones, as we have seen before. The breaking of the seventh seal introduces a new set of seven symbols that introduce prophetic periods. These are the seven trumpets. The half hour of silence. Revelation 8, 1 and 2. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, the half hour is a symbol. It's a short period of time. It wasn't exactly half hour. It was probably several years, actually. A short time of peace on earth. I think the silence in heaven means a time of peace for the church. Jesus often called the church the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 13, in the parables. The gospel is being preached, souls saved, attitudes and lives changed, even in the barbarian nations. The preaching of the gospel is what is sealing the people of God. The seal is the Holy Spirit. The time of peace is from about 311 A.D. to about 400 A.D., so you see it's almost 100 years. The seal is the Holy Spirit. At what point in one's conversion does the Holy Spirit come into the convert's life? From, sex, from Acts 2, 38 and 39, we learn that it is after baptism in water for the forgiveness of sins that the Holy Spirit is given to the believer as seal of his or her salvation. Read Romans 8. To learn all the wonderful things the Spirit does for the Christian. 
the prayers with the incense. Revelation 8, 3 and 4. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now remember, that's the altar of incense, and the, uh, the incense represents the prayers of the saints. But in this case, it says the incense was added to the prayers of the saints, which is kind of interesting. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Actions of angels. The actions of angels represents act activities on earth. Every time an angel does something, it has an effect on what happens on the earth. Here we have the saints aware and apprehensive of what was coming. Their prayers with influence will influence their Heavenly Father to protect them in the coming onslaughts. The incense mixed with their prayers is the intercession of the Holy Spirit mixed with their prayers. Romans 8, 26-28 but The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. Helps us when we pray. Thrown onto the earth. Revelation 8, 5 and 6 then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar, that would be the brass altar, where the fire comes from, for the incense, and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder, and sounds, and flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the sound, thunder was sounds, there were other sounds, so we'll talk about them later. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. Effective fervent prayer. What does the Bible say about that? The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man. The angel takes the fire from the brazen altar and adds it to the incense to burn it on the golden altar in the most holy place where God's throne is. James says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. This is represented by the burning incense thrown onto the earth because of the prayers of the saints that this is happening. Manifestation from the throne. If you remember, these same manifestations, the sound, the lightning, the thunder, the earthquake from the throne have been seen and reported by John in chapter 4. These symbolize great political and cultural upheavals on the earth. God has heeded the prayers of his people and will exercise his authority and control on earth in the coming events. Sounds. What are the sounds? Thunders represent God's voice of authority, in my opinion. What then do the sounds represent? What do they symbolize? In chapter 4, these sounds emanating from the throne are called rumblings to distinguish them from thunders. I think it is other voices that have a part in bringing these judgments on the empire. Just my opinion. Lightning, thunder, and earthquakes. Fierce war clouds are building on the fringes of the Roman Empire that will bring great political and cultural upheavals. Soon these storms with their symbolic lightning, thunder, and earthquakes will blow across the whole western part of the empire, Western Europe. There will be a series of four such storms, as we listed on slide four, Goths, Vandals, Huns, and Heruli. Father knows best. Our Father, of course, is God. What is to come will seem at the time terrible and destructive, but will turn out to be what is best for the world and especially God's people. God's promise that he is at work in all things for the ultimate good of his people those who have been called, or who have accepted his invitation, according to his plan and purpose, Romans 8.28, is applicable here. Eternity is always in God's perspective. It is not always in ours. Isn't that the truth? Here we have an ancient Egyptian trumpet. The first trumpet. Revelation 8, 7. The first sounded, meaning trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. 
and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now what does that represent? The Empire on the Eve of the Barbarian Invasions at 395 A.D. Around 395 A.D. That was the extent of the empire. See, uh, southern England, a lot of northern Africa, and uh, to uh, Persia and Afghanistan. Three parts, which I find interesting. The Roman Empire divided in, three, in these visions into three parts. The European part, from the Adriatic to the Atlantic, North to the Mediterranean, north of the Mediterranean Sea, the eastern part, east of the Adriatic, in other words, the Asian part. The final third was the African part, most of North Africa. There are other ideas of what these thirds were as well, but these are mine. Each of these four invasions affect a particular part of the empire, divided also into land and trees sea and rivers and streams and also remember there was grass also mentioned burned up all the green grass here we have another version another map of these invasions notice they all come from the northeast the goths the first to come were the goths i quote bw johnson who got most of his information from gibbon that's edward gibbon the historian who wrote the decline and fall of the roman empire B.W. Johnson's book is called uh, People's, New Test People's New Testament with Notes, Commentary, or The Divine, let's see, I forget, his, his commentary on Revelation has another name, something about the divine, something or other. I quote B.W. Johnson, who gets most of his information from Gibbon for the most concise explanation of this sign. About A.D. 400, the four winds could be held no longer. The Goths gathered out of the mysterious lands of the unexplored north, and like a mighty torrent threw themselves a mighty, dauntless, savage host upon Rome. Bar barbarous as the Indians of the desert, they left behind their march, scarred, scorched, blackened, bloody, and desolated lands. Countries blooming like gardens, were turned into treeless deserts. In AD 409, under Alaric, their king, they descended on Italy. It had not seen the face of a foreign enemy for 800 years. At last, the host gathered around the imperial city. After a long siege, in the dead hour of night, the gates were opened by the hands of the traitors, and the barbarians rushed in. Here we see Alaric in Rome. For three days the sack went on before they were glutted with blood and spoil. Then their leader, having died, they retired, loaded with spoil. The iron hail of war, the fire of burning towns and cities, mingled with the blood of the slain defenders, the scorched and blackened lands, denuded of their fruit trees, and the grass trodden underfoot by the march of armies, all correspond surprisingly with the language of the scripture words of B.W. Johnson it is strange alas how the infidel Gibbon has chosen the very language of inspiration to describe some of the events of this period I will quote a few phrases found in his 31st chapter and descriptive of the great invasion of Alaric and the Goths. This is quoting Gibbon. The tremendous sound of the Gothic trumpet stirred the host to invasion. At the first sound of the trumpet, the Goths left their farms to rush in and in, on in invasion. Uh, Gibbon is continuing here. The Gothic conflagration consumed the empire. Blood and conflagration and the burning of trees and herbage marked their path. Here is surely a remarkable fulfillment of the symbolism that follows the first trumpet. Johnson. Notice the uh, quotation from Gibbon stops at path above. The earth and third of the trees and grass. J 
Johnson thought the literal burning of the trees and grass was the fulfillment of this prophecy, but he doesn't deal with the burning of the earth. The earth was burned and the trees and grass were burned. I think this was symbolic. The earth is the government. The trees and grass were the upper and lower echelons of government. It was the government that was destroyed. So was physical destruction as well. The second trumpet. Revelation 8, 8 and 9. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now is that true? It's exactly a third of the sea and a third of the ships and a third of the creatures over? Well, I don't think it said a third of the creatures. A third, okay. Symbolic numbers are not always easy to un interpret. My understanding of these thirds is as if a third of the empire is destroyed by each invasion, but it seems to be the same third, a little more destruction in the same third with each invasion, and in other instances of similar numer numerology, the number is not intended to bear, be an exact quantity. This was true of the number in each tribe that was sealed on the vi in a vision of chapter 7. Remember there were 12,000 of each tribe to come out exactly at 144,000. More on this later. Another view of the map of the barbarian invasion. The Vandals come next. Again, Johnson writes, the second trumpet implies a warfare upon the sea. Let us turn to history. The Goths completed their work about AD 409. About 10 years later, another mighty horde of northern barbarians was sweeping south. The principal tribe was called the Vandals, from whence our word vandalism. Here we have the path of the Vandals. The dark black line. They rushed over Gaul, that's present day France, the territory we call France, swept through Spain, leaped over the narrow straits, straits of Gibraltar, and wrested northern Africa from the Roman dom dominion. Then they threw themselves like a burning mountain upon the sea and filled it with fire and blood. In order that they might assail Rome on the seas and carry their armies to the islands and to Italy, they built fleets and struggled for the mastery of the Mediterranean Sea, my words, which until then had been a Roman lake. For 600 years, no ship hostile to Rome had disputed the mastery of the sea, but now it became the theater of war. Fleets meet in the shock of battle. The sea is reddened with the blood of the slain. The Roman ensign goes down, died in blood. The islands of the sea fall into the hands of the fierce barbarian. And at last, near 30 years after the contest began, their fleets land their armies in Italy and they rush upon Rome. The city is besieged, falls, and for 14 days a pitiless barbarian soldiery spare neither age nor sex. The spoil gathered for 800 years from a hundred conquered nations is carried away and loaded upon the Vandal fleets, and the blasted, scour scourged, and pillaged capital is abandoned as unworthy to be held as a permanent possession. Surely these facts correspond to the second trumpet vision. This is a uh, wormwood, and they're bitter herb, very bitter herb. The third trumpet, Revelation 8, 10, and 11. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called wormwood, and a third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter.
the Huns. These were the Huns. Here again I quote Johnson and Gibbon. The blazing meteor that follows the sound of the third trumpet has been found to imply some mighty leader who suddenly appears and enters upon a baleful work. Is there such a leader? Before A.D. 440, the Romans knew nothing of the Hungarian nation. About that time, there suddenly appeared as a meteor would flash in the sky, a warrior upon the banks of the river Danube, with 800,000 fighting men under his banners. Here we have the rivers of the Roman Empire, especially with Italy, France, Germany, and Spain. Rivers of Europe. They had come from the depths of Central Asia, marched north of the Euxine Sea through Russia, and now knocked at the river boundary of the Roman Empire. Overcoming opposition to their passage of the Danube, they rushed westward, crossing the river Rhine and on the river Marne were met in conflict by the hosts of Rome. This is the Rhone River. The historians tell us that the blood of slaughtered heroes made the river run with, red with blood and that from 150,000 to 300,000 bodies of the dead attested to the fury of the contract, conflict. Then they, de then they desolated the river Rhone to its mouth, turning southward on the, bank of the river, banks of the river Rhone, the host met again in fury that is, the Romans and the Huns. Then, descending from the Alps, the fierce warrior on the banks of the river Po contended for the mastery of Italy. Victorious, he marched southward to seize the imperial prize. Unable to counter, to contend longer, Rome sent a priestly deputation to ask him to depart. By rich bribes and by work on his superstition, they succeeded, and he retired, made Buddha on the river Danube his capital, and founded the Hungarian nation. When he died, his followers turned the waters of the Danube from its course, buried him in its bed, and then let them return to flow over the grave of the hero. Beneath the waters of the river Danube still lie the bones of the star called Wormwood that fell upon the rivers. The trumpets have blown, three awful blows have been struck, and the weakened empire is ready to fall when the fourth trumpet blows. The fourth trumpet. Revelation 8:12. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. So the luminaries of the empire were struck, I guess that's it. The fourth trumpet, the Heruli. Continuing with Johnson and Gibbon, describing the events depicted under the fourth trumpet, we have found that the Goths struck their blow around A.D. 409, the Vandals from the sea about A.D. 422, and Attila, meaning the Hun, upon the rivers about A.D. 440. What follows? Odoacer, the first barbarian king of Italy, leader of the Heruli. We are to seek the fulfillment in the next and final invasion of Rome. It occurred A.D. 476. Odoacer, king of the Heruli, a northern race, encouraged by the apparent weakness of the falling empire, besieged and took the almost helpless city. Augustulus, the feeble emperor, was hurled down. The Roman Senate that had met for 1228 years was driven from the Senate chambers. The mighty fabric of the empire fell to the dust, and the great men were humbled never to rise again. This was darkened. Empire was darkened. 
Sun, moon, and stars, emperor, princes, and great men are smitten, lose their power, and cease to give light. Nay, more, there now began the period called by all historians the Dark Ages. The fall of Rome introduced a period when intellectually and spiritually the day and night were darkened, when the minds of men were blinded, and when the church, falling gradually into apostasy, gave forth for ages on a feeble light to human souls. Again, the correspondence is complete. The Late Empire and First Barbarian King Kingdoms 250, 285 to 451. Take time. Hit the pause button if you need more time to study it. This vertical line is the division between the Eastern and the Western Empire. The Eastern Empire is the the uh, capital was at Constantinople. Western Empire, the capital was at Rome. Barnes and Johnson agree. Albert Barnes, in his con commentary, and B.W. Johnson, in his, agree completely on this section of the prophecy. I could find no clearer elucidation of these things than the words of Johnson, who quotes the historian Gibbon extensively. So we have four barbarian invasions that affect a third of the empire. The Vandals invaded North Africa, and the Huns invaded the Eastern Empire, but neither were able to hold on to those areas. So it was a third of the empire, Western Europe, that was permanently affected. The third part. Here is Johnson's explanation of the third part. The third part is named, is named each of these four judgments. The first falls on a third part of the earth, the second on a third part of the sea, the third part, the third on a third part of the rivers, and the fourth on a third part of the sun, moon, and stars. Now we know this is all symbolic. The sun was not the sun, it represented something else, and the earth represents not the earth, but something else, and so forth. Here we have another map showing the Western Empire as being under the control of the barbarians. If, there were, if they were to fall upon a third part of the great Roman world, upon its land provinces, upon its seas, upon its river systems, and upon emperors and rulers, the whole world thus would be, the whole would be, the whole would thus be fulfilled. I'll get it right eventually. This is just what took place during a great part of the period when the events were taking place, which are covered by the seven trumpets, the great Roman world was divided into three parts. It would be the the uh, east, the western part, which would be Europe, Western Europe, eastern part, which would be the uh, Asiatic part of the empire, ruled from Constantinople, and the third would be Northern Africa. Gibbon says, from the age of Charlemagne to that of the Crusades, the world, for I would, for I overlook the remote monarchy of China, was occupied and disputed by the three great empires or nations of the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Franks. The three great nations of the world, the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Franks, encountered each other on the plains of Italy. The words of Gibbon. According to Johnson, these quotations, which might be multiplied, show that during the long period of a thousand years, a period embraced in the fulfillment of the visions of John, the civilized world was divided into three distinct parts, and that these were clearly marked in history. Here we see the one part, Europe, Western Europe. He continues. It is upon one of these parts, a third part, the western third part, called the Latin or Frank part, that all of the of the calamities of the four invasions, Goths, Vandals, Huns, and Hurley fell. It was the western third part, the old Roman Empire, which fell 
forever under their blows. Here we see it divided again, the vertical line. Questions for discussion. What part did the, praise, the prayers of God's people have in bringing on the four barbar barbarian invasion? What sim symbolic act shows this? Take your time if you're in a group, you can discuss it. Here's a pause button. What part of the Roman Empire was each invasion supposed to affect, according to the text? What are the possible meanings of this third part? Hit the pause button again if you need more time. Name and tell something about each of the four groups of invaders. If you're in a group, you can discuss that among yourself. Hit the pause button again to do so. I wrote a little something about why, why is there so much symbolic language in the prophecies? And this is my theory. Why such symbolic language? Here we see a symbol from both from Revelation and the book of Daniel, the seven head, ten horned beast. In the first of these lessons, I gave my theory that the prophecies in this book are not to warn in order to make it possible for people to prevent these events from happening, but to be understood after the event to prove that the prophet spoke from God. So the prophecies fulfilled little by little in each generation to the end of time was to serve as proof of the inspiration of the Bible after the miracles had ceased. We've seen these winds of war predicted in the book of Revelation. We know what they are now. We read about each one. Conclusion. We have seen the four winds of war unleashed on the Western Empire. We now know the names of these invading winds. History calls them the Goths, Vandals, Huns, and Heruli. The barbarian tribes became just as Romanized as the former conquered peoples of the old empire had become. Here we have a Gothic cathedral. They became Christianized, and the architecture of the great buildings and even many of the in institutions of Europe were changed for the better by them. As usual, God brought out a order out of chaos. The Four Winds Blow, a poem by Ellis Jones. The empire was divided. Two ways of life collided. The Goth, Gothic hordes came down. The Roman world was churning. Everything was burning. Goth pillage field and town. Alaric was their leader. His cavalry was fleeter. His forces scorched the land. Anxiety was growing. An ill wind was blowing. The Romans could not stand. And then came the Vandals. And the Rom amid the Roman scandals, they fought Rome on the sea. The sea ran red with blood, thick as the Roman mud. They fought to victory. Then the Huns with Attila, a wild and reckless killer, heaped the bodies of the dead along each bloody river by army arrows from his quiver, he turned the da Danube red. Soon another warrior came. Odo Acker was his name. He ruled in Rome a while. He was, he, it was because of him the light of Rome grew dim. Then he was slain through guile. Here's a page from the Gothic Bible in the Gothic language. The winds of war had come. 
their hurtful work was done. Nothing now would be the same. With God at the controls, he still was saving souls. Thousands more now knew his name. Next, Lesson 13 of 26, Rise of Islam, the Muslims, Arabs, and Turks, Revelation 9. The end. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.